Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, so for this week's Hack Night, we're going to be talking about uh, server-side web exploitation. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm John uh, in the lab, pretty much always there. Uh, before I get started, I just want to thank Kent, who wrote most of these slides. I just came in at the end and kind of modified them a little bit. Uh, so big thank you to Kent for bringing these slides together. Uh, cool. Yeah, so anybody that wants to follow along, if you go to uh, osiris.link slash hn3, the slides are right here. Uh, and then for demos, we're going to be doing some of the offset challenges. Uh, so if you just go to osiris.link slash class, it will take you to the class website. Um, all you need is the NYU uh, ID to sign into the class website, and you have access to all the challenges. Uh, cool. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is a lot of the basic um, web stuff, so things like SQL injection, file inclusion, directory traversal, uh, object desterilization, um, template injection, XXE, uh, CLRF, and server-side request forgery. Um, yeah, and then sanitation, which is a really messy thing that web, uh, it's hard to, really, really hard to handle. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be talking about is what happens when you go to google.com? Um, this is a question that is a really common interview question where the interviewer will ask you this and they'll expect you to describe as much, of, like basically just, you just put everything um, that you know about the internet out, you just say it. <laughs> um, does anybody want to give it a shot? Okay, well, cool. Sorry, Take um, what happens when you go to Google.com? Uh, does dump out everything you know? Yeah, everything. <laughs> it, it's not months, but uh, the, there's a part. I know there's a part of the DNS resolution where it goes and finds the match Google or to some kind of number. Uh, I think you know somehow that the, that question mark after the question mark means it's some kind of parameter. Uh, cool. That's the query that you're searching. Yeah, the, the get parameter, yeah, that's what that is. Yes, and that search part is probably the actual page we're going to. Yep, yep, that's... That's, that's about sums of what I know. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's, yeah, everything that you said was right there. Um, yeah, so, okay. So continuing, let's talk about the structure of a URL. Um, the way that you access anything on the internet is through a URL, and as it turns out, there's kind of a lot more than just, you know, HTTP um, dot, uh, colon slash slash website slash path, right? There's a whole lot more to it. You can have um, built-in authentication with the user and password. You can have all different types of schemas. You can have queries. You can have comments in URLs. And it gets really, really messy because um, we have to design software that will be able to actually take a URL and pull it art apart into pieces. And as it turns out, that's a lot harder said than done. Um, yeah. So uh, for this... Uh, right here. We have our schema right here, which is HTTP Hypertext Transfer Protocol. You have your username and password at, and then the website, and then you have your port, your path, and then your query, and then your fragment right there. Um, yeah. So, um, for this right here, um, you have HTTP, Google.com, search, and uh, your uh, query right there. Um, yeah, so, uh, when you type in google.com into your browser, what happens uh, is it sends an HTTP request to uh, what is sometimes referred to as the net location, which is would be the www.google.com right there. Um, yeah, so how do URLs, how does this URL get translated into an HTTP request? Um, the HTTP protocol is pretty simple. It's really easy to be read by humans, um, which is a really good thing. Um, because right here, this is the raw HTTP request. Your browser would include some extra stuff on top of this, but at the very basics, this is this is what it is right here. Um, the most basic part of a, uh, the HTTP protocol is a GET request. So you do GET and then your path right here with your um, query parameters and stuff. You say the HTTP version that you want, and then you say the host. So that's going to be whatever the net lock is, the net location. And that's pretty much it that you actually need for uh, to make an HTTP request. So if you really wanted to, you could get out your friendly little netcat program, connect directly to whatever website that you want, and type this out, and it will give you back an HTTP response. Um, the simplicity of this protocol is part of the reason why it's so popular. Um, it's just really easy to use. It's really easy to read. And yeah. 
Um, yeah, so, yeah, and then this is just the, the www.google.com search right here. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how um, web servers actually work. So this is a really simple uh, Flask app example. Um, Basically, you, the most common way to do it is you will have routes that have handlers, and those handlers will do something for you, right? They will run some code and then give back a response. So for this right here, um, it's saying that if your path is to slash some page, it will just render a template, which is like an HTML file with like some extra stuff that like can run stuff. Uh, and then it just gives that back, right? Um, yeah, so let's talk about some bugs. Um, so this is a really fun one, uh, command injection. So what some websites will do, uh, this is a really common thing on routers, is they will take um, some input from us, and then they will just like paste it into a, um, a system call, right? So in this example right here, we're using the ping command. The ping command basically just connects to um, some remote machine and just sends data back and forth. It's uh, mostly used to debug network connections. Um, yeah, so a really common thing for browsers to do is, uh, it's not browsers, excuse me, for routers to do is they'll let you try to ping something from, from the router. So they'll take a IP directly from you and then paste it directly in here, um, which will get called directly out to the command line. So I'm sure that a lot of you probably already see that because it's taking um, input directly from us, it's not sanitizing it in any way, it's just putting it directly on the shell, um, we can actually break out of this and do some fun stuff. So yeah, so if we, for example, right here, made our IP, you know, localhost, and then semicolon to break out of the, that, that one command and did cat flag.txt, it would not only give us back the output from this command, from the ping command, it would also give us the flag, right? So that's a really simple example of uh, command injection right there. Um, yeah, so there are, for most of the common web frameworks for like Flask, which is Python, um, PHP, uh, JavaScript, there are a couple of functions that you always want to be really, really careful about using if you're ever, you know, writing a web server or whatever, um, like system eval, uh, exec pass through, or so process.run. Uh, anytime you're running those on a web server, you have to be really careful what you're passing to it, or else you will get into a situation like this. Um, yes. So, okay, here's another good one, uh, SQL injection. So, um, this is another um, example where we're directly going to be putting um, input from us directly onto something that's getting executed, right? So in this case, it's SQL. Um, for those of you that haven't seen SQL before, basically, uh, anytime you put a username and a password in the website, um, it will likely, the way that it's set up, is it will retrieve the, the row in the database for that user and then like do some kind of password comparison, right? Um, what some web servers will do is they will, um, just hash their password and then uh, compare it against the thing uh, in the data database. And as long as it returns something, then it will log you in, right? That's a really common thing from like, you know, 15, 20 years ago uh, for websites to do. So if it's taking input directly from us and running it in SQL, what we can do is just like before, we can break out of the query that we were currently in and modify it in some way, right? It's like, for us right here, if we used a, uh, a double quote right here, we would break out of this user equals right here, and then all of the rest of this in between here will be as actually modify the query itself, right? So, um, or user equals admin will make it so that it will return the admin row, and then that is the comment character right there, the double um, thing. Um, something that I found, this is a nice little trick for CTF challenges, what some browsers will do um, is if you're putting this into a, uh, a login form, sometimes it will actually strip the white space off. So um, something that's uh, a nice little trick to do is to like add an extra character past your uh, thing right here because there has to be a space right there or like MySQL won't accept it. Um, yeah, nice little fun thing. Um, yeah, so yeah, this is what our query would look like after we've done our uh, SQL injection where we have the or user equals admin and the comic character to get rid of the rest of the, the, the thing. Um, yeah, so in MySQL, there is a really interesting database that's built in called the Information Schema. Uh, the Information Schema has a bunch of tables with information about all the different tables, all the different columns, all the different databases that are 
hosted on that server. Um, this is really useful to us because, as it turns out, we can use the information schema when we have um, SQL injection to leak information out about the server itself, about the database, any data in it, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you guys know uh, about, like, I think it was like three or four years ago with the whole Equifax thing where they leaked out a bunch of stuff. That was um, blind SQL injection where they leaked out data this way. Um, so this stuff is still definitely seen uh, out in the wild. Um, yeah, so the next class of bugs that we're going to be talking about is uh, directory traversal type stuff and local file inclusion. So um, what some websites will do is they will have uh, things be templated. Uh, what that means is like you'll have a get parameter with a file name and then it will just get back that file name or something along those lines, right? Um, so again, because it's taking raw input from us, it's not sanitizing it in any way. Um, it's just going to send the file back, like whatever file we give. Um, you know, it's totally harmless if it's just index.html, right? Because it will just get back that. What if we do, you know, dot dot slash dot dot slash blah 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 Etsy password, right? Which is a configuration file on Unix. Um, well, if since we're not doing any sanitation here, since we're taking raw input from the user, um, it will happily give back Etsy password for us. Um, Oh, for those of you that might not know, the dot dot slash means like back a directory. So um, what this means is I go back a directory, back directory, back directory, back directory, and then Etsy password. Um, yeah, fun stuff. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about remote file inclusion. Uh, this is a, I, I've never seen this outside of PHP. So PHP has this fun little function called include, where basically it will, um, get whatever file you're, or uh, that you're asking for and run it in that space right there. Um, so up until pretty recently, you could actually request things over HTTP for that. What that means is that you could actually like remote include a uh, PHP file. Um, so yeah, like what happens if, you know, it's getting the, the request file uh, parameter right here. Um, what happens if, you know, evil.com slash evil.php right there. Um, well, it will happily run that PHP on the server and then give you back the response. Um, that's a really dangerous thing. Interestingly enough, um, PHP does not allow this by default anymore, but you can still turn it on. <laughs> so you can, this still is a thing. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the next thing is template injection. Um, uh, what a lot of websites will do, one of the most popular frameworks that I've worked with is Flask. Um, Flask has this templating engine called uh, Jinja uh, that it uses for templates, uh, for HTML templates. Basically makes, you can like um, run Python basically in HTML and then it will render the output for you. Um, yeah, so if you don't handle your templates correctly, you can really easily get um, RCE or remote code execution, which is a common thing. Um, yeah, so uh, right here, what you're doing right here is you're rendering a template directly from a string, which is a really dangerous thing to do. The even more dangerous thing is that you're getting a parameter from the user and just putting it directly there. Now, because this template uh, templating engine runs code directly on the server, uh, you know, it's totally okay if we just do hello. What happens if we start running actual code? So this, these brackets mean like run whatever is inside of here, and then it's three times three, um, and then you get nine. Uh, this is a really common thing for uh, just sanity checking. If you think that you have template injection to just do, you know, a bracket bracket three times three or two times three or whatever, just to see if it will evaluate it. Um, yeah. So that's all well and good that we can do some simple multiplication, but I would like to get some RCE, some remote code execution, right? So um, as it turns out, the way that Ginger works is it basically runs Python. It's pretty close to Python. It's not exactly Python, but. Um, yeah, so Python has a lot of um, hidden functions and things. Um, basically, you can build out from an empty string. You can do this dot dot class um, dot um, mro dot um, to our subclass to subclasses to uh, it gives you all these classes that are subclasses like anything that's been imported um, anything that's below object. It will just give you that. Uh, one of those things is subprocess.popen, which will run things for you. Um, so yeah, if you put in parentheses right there, any string that's a, like a bash command, it will actually run that. 
uh, using this. Uh, this is specifically Python 2. It's a little bit different in Python 3, but yeah. Yeah. My guess is that might be a little bit fast for people who haven't seen object hierarchies in Python. Um, yeah. With a, another quick, you know, 30 seconds of like what MRO is doing and so on. Um, yeah, I don't actually know what MRO stands for. Basically, what you're doing here is you're accessing directly the object, like the object class in Python, which pretty much everything is below. Um, and then you're getting everything that's below object. <laughs> so pretty much anything that's in scope, you can access there. Um, it's a little bit complicated. Most of the time, I just copy this and don't think about it uh, when I need to do that in a CTF challenge or whatever. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions about that? Awesome. Um, yeah, so now we're gonna be talking about object sterilization. Um, yeah, so uh, the most common one is Apache struts, which I completely do not understand. I actually tried to write an offset challenge for Apache struts. Um, if anybody's ever written an Apache struts application, I'm sorry, that is an awful framework. I couldn't get it to work. Um, Basically, it's really easy to, um, uh, yeah, this was also part of Equifax, too, um, one of the multiple times that they've been popped. Um, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about um, sterilization here. Um, basically, we have this problem in, uh, with uh, remote servers, right? We might want to save the state of an object um, to use at a later date, right? The way that we do this is serialization. Um, different languages have different ways of handling this. Um, this is PHP right here. The way that PHP handles it is you do, um, it will give you a fars object. Basically, it will convert a object in memory into a string that can then be reloaded back later um, for use at a later date, right? Um, this is a really dangerous thing because you're basically gonna be loading um, something uh, from a file in memory, uh, it might you might be able to run something basically. Um, so what this does right here is if you try to unsterilize unsterilize this um, in PHP, it will get the file contents of whatever the file path is right here. So if you find a server that is will just happily take um, a, a far object, then um, you can just give it this right here, and it will print out your flag.txt. Um, yeah, I think the, it's a little bit more clear in Python, but, um, yeah. Um, it's basically just an object representation, uh, in a string form. If you find one of these, it's really dangerous. <laughs> um, I actually saw this when I was working at the, uh, I used to work for the Office of Information Security here at NYU, like the team that's responsible for, um, the information security of, like, all of you guys, basically. We saw some of this stuff do some real damage. Um, so this is like definitely still a thing. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So for these are some really great libraries for generating um, that type of stuff. Um, yeah. For PHP, it's the FARs. For Java, it's like Apache struts. For Python, it's this wonderful thing called Pickle. Um, if you want to try a Pickle challenge, I actually have one on Seesaw Red that's running right now. Um, yeah, so now we're going to be talking about XXE. Uh, XXE is not something that's seen so much anymore, but it's definitely worth still talking about. Um, so I'm sure that most of you guys have done HTML or just anything that's XML. Um, as it turns out, XML is a Turing complete language, so you can like actually like run stuff in it, um, which is a completely unnecessary thing for it to do, but hey, it does it anyway. Um, yeah, so you can define entities within XML, which are basically like objects, right? Um, for this right here in XML, you can define system objects, which are basically like um, the most useful thing for us is like a file. So you can do like file slash slash file.txt. Um, and then when you go ahead and try to access that entity, uh, it will, that entity, we're calling it name right here, and then we're accessing it as name right here. It will just happily give you back uh, file.txt, the contents of file.txt, worth still talking about. Um, yeah, so here's another good one, um, CRLF, um, uh, carriage return line feed. So uh, what this is, is basically in part of the HTTP protocol, 
Um, basically, at the end of the line, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to have a carriage return, so like a slash R, and then a slash N to like bring it back to the end of the line. That's actually part of the HTTP spec. I think it will actually work without that, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, so basically, because of this, if you have a query in here, um, uh, you can basically modify what's actually in the um, what the actual uh, query uh, uh, the HTTP query looks like by doing a slash r slash n right here, and you change your host. So for us, it's changing this right here to uh, this. Um, so it will look like it's going to, um, you know, maybe something that's internal on that web server that we're not supposed to access, right? Um, this is another one that doesn't come up so much. Um, I think that there is a CTF challenge pretty recently where basically somebody like rolled their own HTTP web server. Um, th this is like something that doesn't come up that much anymore, but definitely worth talking about. Yeah, so server-side request forgery. So this is when you basically trick a web server into making a request for you. Um, this is a really common thing in CTF challenges, like anytime you want to extract a flag or do anything like that. Um, yeah, so at the most basic level, what if there is a website that will only take a, a ARN for proxy, it will just make that request and it will give it back to you, right? Um, if it's making a request for you, then, you know, what if you make it so that it's, you know, file Etsy password, right? You're tricking it into not making an HTTP request to something out on the internet. You're tricking it into, you know, getting Etsy password or, you know, slash fly that TXT. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so for some, uh, I don't think this is a thing on AWS anymore, but on, if you had an a AWS box, you could just like get this from internally and it would give you some, some like I am stuff. Uh, I don't know. It's, it, Part of their like credential storage thing, um, yeah. So it's a fun thing. Um, yeah. So I've talked a little bit about different schemas uh, so far. Uh, there's HTTP. There's uh, FAR. There's LDAP, File Gopher, FTP, DICT, JavaScript, Data FAR, uh, Mail2, which is for SMTP. Um, yeah. There are a lot of schemas, and uh, things will handle them differently. Yeah, so FAR is the PHP um, serialization thing that I was talking about. Um, so anytime you want to um, serialize an object uh, in PHP, it will give you back a FAR object. Uh, and then, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, this is, this is a good one. So URLs are a really, really hard thing to handle. Um, if I gave you the task to um, be able to parse a URL, to pull out the schema, the net location, the port, the username, the password, uh, the path, the query, and the um, the fragment, go like just go ahead and think about it for a second. Like, how would you actually go about doing that? I can guarantee you that everyone in the room right now has a different idea how to do it. So there's obviously like a hundred different ways to do it and they all do it differently and it, you can trick them into doing different things. Um, yeah, so for this right here, uh, oh yeah, this is a really nice trick. If you do slash slash, it will do the default uh, schema for whatever it is. So like I think if you, I think that this is still a thing like on Chrome and Firefox. If you do slash slash evil.com, it will, um, uh, do HTTP by default. Um, so this is a really nice trick for, um, like in this example, it's um, trying to filter out HTTP. Uh, so it will like accept other schemas um, and it will do things with that. If you do this right here, if the default um, schema for like whatever it's using right there, if it's like the Python request library or something, um, it will make an HTTP request for that. So that's a nice little trick. Um, uh, okay, parsing, yeah, so I got a little bit ahead of myself in the last one. Um, the URL parse function for, um, let's see, yeah, um, okay, so this is, this is like what I was alluding to a little bit earlier. Uh, we have google.com, google.com, and 127.0.0.1, uh, and some weird characters in between. Um, does anybody want to take a crack and guess which one uh, would be parsed as the net location, like as the actual place that the um, that this request would be requesting from. Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody? 
everybody. Richard? I see you laughing. Uh, I'm confused myself. Yeah, um, so where would this request actually go? So, local host? so it's a bit of a trick question. Um, it would actually depend on what library you're using. So just within Python, there are three different libraries, as, as specifically Python 2, that will all parse this differently. It will all, all, um, all of them will take different um, portions of the URL and make it the net location. So um, uh, uh, this is a really common CTF challenge. Um, it's actually, I have one running in red right now that's really similar to this. Uh, where basically it will check with one URL parse um, for the net location, and then it will make the request with something that's using a different URL parse. Um, yeah. Uh, so like for this, it's basically saying um, the host has to be this, like whatever CTF this was, uh, .org, um, and then it will just go ahead and you get it with a, the user agent being the flag, right? So you can um, use this uh, type of thing where you basically just guess, you just move around which one is your server until you get it right, pretty much. That's how you do that challenge. Um, yeah, and then that's how you do that. Um, yeah, so... Um, Another part of the HTTP protocol is redirects. Um, basically what that is, is you can return, um, you can tell, uh, make the return say like, oh, I'm not actually here, I'm somewhere else. Um, this is a really common thing, uh, a common way of doing a C-SERP attack uh, where, you know, you could, um, maybe you control something that is allowed to see and you want to trick it to go somewhere that it's um, not allowed to go. Um, you just like basically three or two it, you redirect it to go to somewhere else, like you know, 127.0.0.1. And then if you get um, if you're able to see the the return from that query, you might be able to access something that you're not supposed to, right? Because it's making the request from localhost. Um, yeah. So now we're gonna talk about sanitation. Um, yeah. Um so with a lot of the things that we've been talking about so far, um, it basically comes down to the fact that we're taking input from a user uh, and we're not sanitizing it in any way. So we're not changing it to make sure that it's not going to affect the query that it's in or the command that it's in or anything like that. Um, so this is where filtering comes in. Um, imagine we wanted to filter out a single quote, right? How would we do that? Well, we would go ahead and um, add an uh, escape character before it. Um, uh, if we made the, uh, the way that we would escape from this is just add a slash before our single quote and it would go ahead and add the slash in right there. Um, oh yeah, so this is another challenge that I have running in red. Um, if we wanted to make it so that the uh, URL wouldn't be able to go back a directory, so do the dot that slash, um, you know, if we just go ahead and replace all of those, um, yeah, we're okay, right? Well. Turns out, no, because what if we go ahead and put uh, four dots and then two slashes? It would just take out that middle one and leave you with the back the dot dot slash. Um, so I guess then we have to just do a recursive filter. So just like keep going until we don't replace anything else, right? Um, yeah, well, that doesn't always work because there is this great thing called uh, Unicode, um, where basically this like weird backwards um, the backwards uh, question mark turns out to be the same um, binary as dot dot slash. So you know you might be able to um, trick the parser into thinking that it's uh, not dot dot slash, and then when it goes to you know MySQL or whatever, it will get converted to dot dot slash. So yeah, uh, ooh, looks like I'm missing some some fonts there. Um, yeah, so then this is. Uh, the double layer where, I, I don't know, I'm missing the, the, the font right there. But it will, uh, if you're recursively checking for the uh, dot dot slash, you can do the same thing with Unicode characters to get around that. Yeah. Um, another nice trick is that you can actually put in null bytes uh, in between your dot dot slashes, and some uh, things will actually take it out. Uh, so if you just do a null byte, a dot, null byte, dot, uh, null byte, and then a slash, um, the 
replace all might um, totally skip this, but then when you pass it along to like actually do whatever with the function that data, it will just go ahead and take out those null bytes. That's another good one. Um, yeah, so here's another good one. Um, for, if we're trying to uh, filter out script tags for um, JavaScript, um, you know, something, uh, a really common thing is you, you can use a Unicode, uh, this like weird Unicode uh, uppercase I type thing. And it, as it turns out, when it gets called with dot lower, which it might do, um, it will get converted to lowercase I. So those are just some of the really awful ways that you can filter things. Um, yeah, so any questions before we go ahead and try some challenges? Yeah, I know I covered it pretty quickly. Hopefully the demos will be more helpful. Cool. Um, so if you guys go ahead to the Offset website, uh, the no, Cyrus.link slash class. Anybody wants to go there. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do some of these challenges. Um, yeah. So, this is a really classic web challenge. So, um, we're challenged to go ahead and log in as admin. Um, let's hopefully this will work. I just turned the box on like an hour ago. Okay. Yeah. Cool. What's up? Um, There we go. Okay, so we're given a website that has a login screen. So, okay, let me turn it off. Uh, okay, cool. So we want to go ahead and log in here. Does anybody have any idea how we would go about doing that? Just shout it out. Wait for what? How would we log in here? SQL injection? Uh, yeah, SQL injection, yes. Yeah, so um, who, who said SQL injection? You want to say what we're going to put in here? Yeah, I know. Single code, space four, one equals one, that does space seven. It's going to go ahead and tell us that we have to enter an email address. So this is a nice little trick for this challenge. Yeah, admin at admin.com. <coughs> well, actually, no. The, the way that you would do this is, um, as it turns out, in HTML, you can um, say that the input type has to be a, uh, can I make this a little bit bigger? You can make it so that the input type is an email. And then it will force you to like match some regex where it'll be like something at something.com, right? Um, all we have to do is go ahead and change that so that it take the type out to be not so that it's not email. We can go ahead and go through and hopefully it will give us our flag. Wow, the internet's really slow. There we go. Yeah, awesome. We have our flag. Um, so yeah, those are two really great things: SQL injection, and then you know, just showing that client-side security is not security. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So let's go ahead to the next one. Um, this is a really complicated one. I'm not going to do that. Um, the ping me. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Um, All right, so we are given a input, uh, something, uh, it just says ping. So let's go ahead and give it a .com. We can go ahead and run ping right there. And it gives us output from a ping command. Um, so it might be taking exactly what we put up here into the IP and uh, putting it directly on the command line. So let's go ahead and test to see if that's happening. Um, so the way that we would break out of this is, well, we don't know if there's if we're being put in quotes or whatever. Um, so let's go ahead and just be safe and try to do some quotes. We can exit out. We can do um, cat slash flag .txt. 
and then a just common character. Um, oh, yeah, so we're getting spaces pulled out. So it's basically checking to see if we have any spaces in our um, in our thing, and it's blocking us from doing that. So um, something that we can do, there's a nice little trick where you can um, do dollar sign IFS. What IFS stands for, it stands for the internal um, field separator. It's basically like in Bash when you're, you can iterate over a string and it will um, break up the string based on the whatever is in the IFS. It's basically just like spaces or tabs by default. Um, either way, this will probably work. Um, oh, nope, okay. Um, so we might not be in quotes then, or we might be in a single quote, let's find out. Uh, nope, still not getting any output. solve this challenge without looking at the solver. Uh, was anybody able to get this? Does anybody have this open? Did you get it, Richard? I didn't get it, but uh, I'm just kind of catching up. Okay, yeah. It's a little slow to load the challenges. Okay. Yeah, you know. so what's actually happening is everybody gets their own container um, on the thing, so it has to spin up a container for everybody, so it's probably being a little bit overloaded right now. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, hold on, I might have saved my solution for this. Yeah, okay. well, well, John, at least this row here, we're all confused about how IFS works because of the, uh, we need a little bit more time to like log in and get to the challenges. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can talk about IFS a little bit more. So it's basically just a variable on like bash or zish or like whatever command line that you're using. It's basically just a tab. That's all it is. Um, Man, that we know will actually return something. Um, maybe just ls. <clears throat> not want to work with me here. Uh, sorry about this. I definitely should have tested this before I, uh, I came out here to live solve this. Um, okay, well, we can move on. Unless I just do something.
Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and try this inclusion challenge right here. So because this challenge is called inclusion, I'm going to guess that it probably has something to do with file inclusion. Um, let's go ahead and take a look right here. So the first thing that I see is that we have a... Um, a page equals right here. Um, what that means is that there's probably somewhere on the web server that it is running something that looks like uh, where are we? Something that looks like this, where it's an include and then it's adding the .php. Um, it's a really common thing in PHP apps. So. Uh, Yeah, so this challenge, uh, the solution is a little bit more complicated than uh, what we've covered here. Um, basically, in PHP, you have these things called um, filters. Uh, let's see if I can PHP um, base 64 and code. Um, yeah, I think it's this right here. Uh, basically, uh, when you have the pound include, um, you can give more, there's a lot of things that you can put in will, where PHP will actually do things for you. Um, yeah, the convert base64 encode is what I'm looking for. Uh, so basically you can give a URL that will um, base64 encode something and then um, give that back as the, as the resource. Um, so the way that we do that is we do PHP. Convert.base64 code. I think that that's how we did that. Um, yeah, right there. Uh, slash resource equals, and then let's try index. Let's see if it gives us back something. Um, okay, did I take that in right? Okay, yeah, there we go. Now we have some base64 on the page. Um, yeah, so basically what this, um, all this filter is doing is when you put in um, that into an include, what it's gonna do is it's going to, um, uh, when it does that include, it's going to base64 encode the, uh, whatever the resource is, and then give it back to you. Um, so for us, this base64 encoded thing should be flag.php that's on the page. Uh, well, okay, um, so if we just do xcode dash uh, that's just going to base 64 decode, oh, valid input. Okay. Oh, it's because I have spaces. Sorry about this. Yeah, there we go. Um, there's our flag. So uh, basically we had a file called um, flag.php that was on the server. Uh, we put in a special link that said base64 encode this thing and then give it back to us. And then, yeah, we just put it in and it worked, right? Because it was doing a include on whatever we give. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions about that? Just wanted to see the URL again. Yeah. Got it there. 
Yeah, sorry, that's really small. There we go. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Anybody have any questions about that? Anything that was happening? There's a lot that was happening right there. Yes. What was that? Uh, is that like a decoder? Um. Yeah. So I'm using Linux here. If you're using Linux on your laptop, if you, you can just like install Xclip. It's basically just a way to programmably interact with your keyboard or with your um, with your clipboard. It's like just copy paste. Like you can copy paste on the command line base. That's all I was doing. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. How's everybody feeling? Do you want to ask questions or keep doing challenges? Yep. I have a question. Ryan, you got a question. I might have missed something, but uh, on the other one, what was preventing you? What like why did you have to use a PHP filter? What was preventing you from just doing you know dot dot slash flag? Um, oh yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, where are we? Where are we? Um, it's adding this dot PHP to the end. So, whatever we give has to end in dot PHP. Um, so it's basically gonna uh, whatever we give, it's gonna add that dot PHP. So we need our URL to end dot PHP, but we still need to actually like get the right file, like the flag file. Um, the the way around that is to use the PHP filter. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So the flag file that's sitting on the server is not a PHP file. Well, it's flag.php. The problem is that uh, if we go back to the actual contents of that, um, I uh, don't want to save that. Um, oh, uh, and I lost that. Uh, bear with me for a second. Oh, that's the wrong challenge. Um, the flag is commented out right here, so even if we did like a page equals flag.php, um, since oh, the flag is commented yeah. out, yeah, we need to like include this, we need to be able to read this flag without actually, um, you know, running the file. So yeah, that's okay. where the base64 yeah, okay. yeah, code comes. Okay. Um, does everybody understand that? Uh, Richard, did you have a question? Was that your question? Oh yeah, my question was, um, Back to the uh, the ping challenge, oh, yeah. at, the 200 point one. Yeah. Uh, just if you look at the source code that they give you for that, um, it would seem to be very useful to just test that. I just thought it might be neat to uh, quickly talk about how you can uh, test PHP code locally. Oh, oops. Um, yeah, so I don't have a PHP um, thing on my laptop because I'm not a sadist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let me see if I can find a solution for that challenge, because that's bugging me. Um, well, you know, just a, it might be fun to be able to test it and step into the PHP and see, you know, how the parser is actually working. To um, yeah, so I actually don't know how to debug PHP. Do you know how to debug PHP? Mm, I think I did it once for one challenge, but that's not enough to remember it for a long time. Okay. Um, oh, I think I just realized what the thing might be. Um, Oh, oh, that was wrong. Just that. Because wow, yeah. they give you the PHP for this. Yeah, that was it. Was it in the description? I can't remember. Uh, yeah. We need the the close quote at the beginning of that injection, so you can download it. Yeah, I have the close quote. So we should be breaking well, out right you, there. All right. So what are you breaking out of? Uh, oh. Uh, well, let me see if I. I think I have it saved on my laptop. Uh, you have the source code. Right? Worth just looking at. It. Uh, yeah. So this is the source code for like what's actually being run on the. Oh, 
Um, let's get out of here. Um, yeah, so it's basically checking to see if IP is in the Git parameters, and then it's um, checking to see if, oh, I remember how to do this challenge now. Oh, yeah. Um, There we go, yeah. Um, okay, so I just needed to see the source to do this. So, um, basically, it's running this function. The way that it's checking to see if it has um, strings in, um, uh, if it has a space in the string, is it's running this function called stir pause. Um, what stir pause does is it's gonna return the index of the first position of a, in this case, a space in the thing. And it's going to, if it's, um, if that uh, gets, uh, evaluated a true, it's going to, you know, just stop. Richard, I, I, you can already see it. Um, if you make the first thing a space, the index that it's going to return is zero. Uh, zero evaluates to false. So as long as you make your first character a space, um, you, you can just have uh, spaces in the rest of your string. Um, so that's a nice little fun logic bug. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so because we had a uh, uh, the, the first thing being a space, we pass that check, and we can go ahead and put in spaces anywhere else. Um, and I can just go ahead and cat flag.txt uh, and get a flag. There we go. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? Cool. Um, how much time do we have left? We have three minutes. Do you guys want to do more questions? Anything else that anybody uh, wants to know about server side? Web exploitation, buddy. Well, I guess we can call it right there. Um, thank you all for coming, listening to me ramble. Probably speak a little bit too fast for <laughs> like an hour. Um, yeah, I think we probably still have pizza in the back if anybody wants to take some. Um, cool. Uh, I'll be around a little bit to answer any questions or anything. But yeah. How do we, oh, this is going to be on YouTube. I'm sorry. Is this video going to be on YouTube? Um, eventually. Yes, yeah, uh, I'm not responsible for that, so I, I have no idea, but yeah, I think so. <laughs> So I can, or... so uh, the content uh, used to be a class, um, it's oh. not being taught this semester, Oh. Um, so I can't like give them just straight up solutions, but we can talk about them, like I was the TA for the class last semester, so. Oh, so good. Um, okay.